family sugaring place was at the other end of the island. When they traveled to the sugar bush, the family packed as lightly as possible. Once they arrived, they would use the frames set up last year for their big sugaring house. There was a smaller wigwam where the tools were stored. There usually was a food cache buried last fall, filled with good things that had lain far beneath the snow. But this year, Dede had already made a trip to the end of the island and raided the cache. To keep from starving, they had eaten, they had already eaten their store during the lean moon. When they arrived, the first thing Mama did was unroll the reed mats for the roof of the shelter, then the blankets, then take out new paddles and the cooking pot. Dede dragged a big kettle and more wooden troughs and paddles from the st small storage house. Anything that wasn't at the sugaring place or anything that broke or wore out, they could make for themselves. Nokomis and Omakias arranged the food they'd brought. There were packets of split dried fish and McCook of special powdered fish, moose meat, a little monoman traded from four with deer meat, smoked fish in a bag of dried pumpkin flowers to thicken soups. Neshki, said Nokomis, happy they had so much. We'll have a good feast. Once a soup was in the making, Nokomis left Angeline to stir and called Amakias to come along and help chop tabs to open the maples. The two wandered a bit until Nokomis found a good ironwood tree. She took out her sharp hatchet and expertly chopped into the tree at regular intervals. She made a series of perfect cuts down the side of the tree and then chopped sideways and split from the tree ten perfect wedges of the hard ironwood. She did this until she had a huge sack full of wedges, which Omakias lugged back to the camp. For two days they prepared, knowing that the sap was just about to start running. There was a feeling to, the time, to that time before the sap began, a quietness that had the going out taste of winter. All that happened in the snow and cold, the storytelling and the sadness too, was left behind. Omakias opened herself to the warming wind. Before them, the sweetness of the maple waited, the warmth of the sun. Omakias, Twilight, and Little Bee carted heavy rocks from the lake shore to weigh down the makooks, and then hauled wa wood for the fire. Omakias's arms were tired, and her cousins too. They complained impatiently to each other as they hunted for the right side stones, or hauled load after load of wood in their arms, dumping it near the big kettle, which was boiling and steaming away. As yet, not one taste of the maple syrup, just the cold, sweet sap. It was always this way before the first taste. The boiling down seemed to take so endlessly long. Pinch watched jealously, jumped on a log to observe Grandma's paddle when it came up, and dipped back down again. Still not ready. Still not. Still not. Then ready. Onto the surface of the big makuk filled with clean snow, Grandma dribbled a thin, dark gold stream of syrup. Pinch could hardly wait for it to cool. Gum sugar! He grabbed while it was still a soft rope, swung the strand into his mouth, and ran, for once quiet instead of yelling, only because his mouth was stuffed. Andig was caught up in the excitement, and he jumped from foot to foot, nearly tumbling from Omakias' shoulder as Angeline poured out more syrup, and then helped Grandma ladle the rest into a sugaring trough. He pecked at a bit of the syrup, but didn't seem to like the sticky feel of it on his beak, and shook his head comically. He put his head in the snow, wiped his beak back and forth, but couldn't remove the hardening syrup. He flew up to a low branch and glared down at them, betrayed, preening his feathers, making his feathers sticky with the syrup, too. Miopoa, po, mino po good, said Omakias, licking up a dollop of thick syrup. The first taste usually made her smile. Not this time. Sadness overwhelmed her when she tasted the sweetness. She instantly recalled the special day she spent with Niwo on the shore of the lake. On that day, long ago, last summer, she had freed him from the tight bonds of his Titanugan. Titanugan, led, let him tumble and play. 
When it came time for her to put him back, she'd sweetened his confinement by placing her last bit of sugar on his tongue. Chickadee, my brother, she cried to Nemo under her breath. She looked around. Pinch was running and jumping, striking out with a stick and pretending to hunt doves. Nokomis was stirring the syrup, using a dancing, kind of smooth movement with her arms. Mama was putting together a stew, and Dede was off somewhere with Fishtail, planning ceremonies that would be held during the sugaring, not far from their camp. Angeline looked at her and said, Nishime, go get some more wood. She, Omakias, was the only one thinking of Niwo. The knowledge made her lonely. If only she could talk to him, look into his cheerful, upslanted eyes, share with him her feelings that he never laughed at, played with him in her arms. She missed him terribly, so much so that her heart seemed to drop right through her stomach with a thud. Muffling her cries, she ran from Camp Street and out into the woods. Angeline was surprised. Usually her sister did not fetch wood with such enthusiasm. Hawa, she called after her little sister. Megwitch. Amakias knew that she would not come back, however. And Angeline could fetch her own wood. She ran with an angry heart, breathing hard, skimming away as fast as she could. She got away from everyone before she sat down on a little patch of dry, sunny ground. At last, it was all right to sob and sob, to let herself cry as much as she wanted to. But the string, strange thing was, as soon as she sat down, she didn't feel like crying anymore. She heard the song of the white-throated sparrow and was soothed by the piercing refrain. She smiled. Nemo's spirit was comforting her. Her eyelids got heavy, the sun warmed her, and she was just about lost in a dream when she was startled by the crackle of sticks and twigs, the shuffle of feet, the interested snuffling, and most of all, the commanding and unmistakable smell, odor of bear. They were with her. Standing quiet at the edge of the little spot of sun, the two young bears gazed curiously, knowingly, at Omakias. Andig flew down suddenly, as though he, little crow, had to protect her from her brothers. The two bears startled a bit at the crow's angry charge, but then shrugged and ignored him. It's okay, said Omakias, and Andig returned to her shoulder. The bears continued to look closely at Omakias, peering with their dim bear eyes, taking in every dot of her scent, remembering it all, knowing. Omakias wished that she had something to give them. She had run away from camp with nothing more than a handful of spirit tobacco in her pocket. They kept looking at her, waiting and watching. The only thing she could think of to give them in the end was some human advice. She decided to warn them about other humans and the dangers they pose. There's a woman, Omakia said softly. Her name is Old Tallow. She's my aunt, but you must stay away from her. The young bear's ears twitched a little. They seemed to listen closely. Be careful too, Omakias went on, when you see something better to eat than usual out in the woods. If it's hanging up out of reach, there might be a pit underneath. That's a trap. You'll fall in and die. And guns, my brothers run fast from men carrying big sticks on their shoulders. Stay away from them. Don't go near the humans, e either the Anishinaabeg or the Chimuku Manug. Stay deep in the woods. Hide if you hear old Talos dogs. Omakias reached in her pocket and took out the little handful of tobacco. She put the tobacco on the ground. When she did, she knew she was asking for something, but she wasn't sure what it was. Words she had not expected came from her lips. Will you give me your medicine? She asked this, but her voice was uncertain. She really didn't know what she meant. She felt embarrassed at herself. I'm pitiful, she said, just as her grandmother did sometimes when praying. I don't know anything. I don't know want to know your medicine. I want to be like Nokomis. I want strong medicines to save my family. Tears came into Amakias' eyes, and she could hardly see, hardly noticed when the bears wheeled and silently disappeared. Help me, she whispered to the ground. Help me. Once she'd finished talking, she lifted her face and looked around. Her bear brothers had vanished, vanished, and she felt better. She set to work, gathering a huge load of dry sticks 
dead branches torn off during the winter by heavy snow and white and ice. As she was piling the branches higher and higher, she saw on the side of a dry piece of birchwood the gray hoof of a mushroom. A tiny voice whispered in her head, a low voice, muttering. When she picked up the branch, the voice grew louder, but she, she still couldn't make out any individual words. She added the branch to her pile, bound the pile with a throng, carried it back to the camp on her shoulders. From time to time, as she walked back to the camp through the wood, she heard a small sound, a word or two, muffled under the snow and leaves. By the time she reached the sugaring camp, she felt a little bit afraid. What were these voices? What did the whispering mean? Standing in the clearing, safe, she peered into the maze of branches and undergrowth. Shining scraps of snow lighted the ground as far as she could see. The sounds of the voices, small and whispering, still floated from the depths of the wood.